Buenas tardes a todos y a todas los que estáis al otro lado de la pantalla. Hello, good afternoon everyone, to all of you who are at the other side of the screen to this new day dedicated to the dark side of the cloud, in this case to feed the beast, data and energy. First of all, thank you all, thank you to the Green Europeans Foundation and Transición Verde as well as La Casa Encendida for hosting these days, which to be honest, are being a very, very interesting series of uh, seminars. This is the second day, and there is still another one remaining that I will talk to you about at the end of this session. I wanted to start by telling you all that when 20 years ago we were told about the clouds, we would all think that it was going to rain or whether it was raining or not. But now, unfortunately, we have less clouds than 20 years ago, but there is an ethereal cloud that is growing and growing nonstop, and it's not made of drops, but rather a matter that is uh, tens of thousands of data that come from devices, cables, infrastructures that consume an amazing amount of resources. I'm talking about minerals, water, and energy, lots of energy. And today, for all of us, it is very difficult to imagine a world where we don't have these technologies, these digital technologies that we uh, humans are quite dependent of. In during uh, last uh, a couple of weeks ago's um, conference, we talked about the consumption of minerals and the water that um, this did, that this invisible cloud requires. We are talking about what energy consumption is, what these new technologies require, and unfortunately, in the world, they are still mainly fossil fuels. And they're actually changing and transforming uh, the planet's climate and that of the whole Earth system. These technologies consume around 5 to 10 percent of the world's consumption of, of electricity. And we have here today three um, high level experts, international experts, who will be talking about this topic. I wanted to let you know that there is interpretation available. You can always access that system thanks to a little tab where it says translation and I also wanted to let you know that you have a chat where you can write your questions for all three participants. And our first speaker and actually the first one to be taking the floor is, is Joseph Tainter, an anthropologist and historian from the US. He's a professor at the State University of Utah and a few years ago he actually published a book of, which is a fundamental reference which is the collapse of complex societies because he studies collapses that have taken place in the past in our history such as Maya's civilization or Chaco civilization and it's all it's always very interesting to learn what happened in the past to try and learn what it is that we're going to be facing in the future. And he is now going to be talking about that topic, complexity of societies and the future in innovation. We also have here today Antonio Arezabala. He's a geologist and a researcher and a consultant. Um, an independent consultant, and he's also collaborating with the University of Zaragoza. Antonio participates in an active way in all scientific debates that are taking place around anthrop um, Anthropocene, which is what we are causing um, in the planet, and with regards to the uh, fact that we're running out of energy resources and minerals, and also the impact of technologies and the impact of cities. And then we have Maria Alegre, she is an expert in um, energy transition and climate change and she is very much focusing on the decarbonization of the electric system and more specifically on the data system. She, it's actually that cloud that brings us all here. For years she has been working for governments and think tanks around these topics and she is a graduate by the University of Torquato Vitela and the London School of Economics. And um, she has a master's in uh, Columbia University. She was born and raised in Argentina, but he, she is connecting from London because that's where she lives, if I'm not wrong. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much. And I will give the floor to Joseph Tainter because we're all looking forward to listening to his presentation, which I'm sure will be shorter than we would like it to be in this new day dedicated to the dark side of the cloud. Thank you very much. First of all, I, I wish everyone a, a good afternoon. And, and I thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak today. 
if you'll give me just a moment, um, I will get my presentation. Here we are. I will get it on the screen. All right. Um, thank you. And uh, I, I'm going to talk today about what I consider the fundamental question of sustainability. And I'll begin by, um, okay, my keyboard is not working. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to contrast two different concepts of our future. Uh, in the first concept, I'll read a couple of quotations that exemplify this concept. Uh, to begin, no society can escape the general limits of its resources, but no innovative society need accept Malthusian diminishing returns. And the second quotation, by allocation of resources to research and development, we may deny the Malthusian hypothesis and prevent the conclusion of the doomsday models. In other words, innovation will bail us out. The alternative concept uh, was voiced, has been voiced by many writers. Uh, one in particular is uh, Jared Diamond, who wrote that a modern societal collapse would be, quote, triggered ultimately by scarcity of environmental resources. So we have here in the first uh, perspective, um, the perspective of what are called technological optimists. Technological optimists believe in what's called the principle of infinite substitutability. Uh, this principle is that resources are never scarce, they're just priced wrong. As resources do become scarce and rise in price, the market signals that there are rewards to innovation and new resources or technologies will therefore emerge. And because of this arg these arguments, sustainability is considered not to be an issue. So this brings me to what I consider the fundamental question of sustainability. Will we always be able to offset natural resource depletion by innovation and increasing technological efficiency? Now we have largely done so until now, and one would say that up until now, the technological optimists have been largely correct. The question is, will they always be correct? Will they be correct indefinitely into the future? So I have two objectives um, in my talk. The first is to explore the origins of our system of innovation and why it's possible. And address secondly, to address constraints to how long it might continue. Now we have to acknowledge that we have certain biases in our perspective of innovation. The first is that since we live in a period of institutionalized innovation, we assume unconsciously that high frequency innovation is normal. And secondly, we have developed ideologies to legitimate, legitimize our current way of life, exemplified in terms like progress and opportunity. My main points are firstly that human history has not been characterized by high rates of innovation. Secondly, today's institutionalized innovation is controlled by specific external conditions. Third, our system of innovation is self-perpetuating under those conditions. And fourth, the continuity of today's system depends on the continuity of those conditions. So firstly, um, history is not characterized by high rates of innovation. Uh, human ancestors have been traced as long ago as 4 million years in Africa. And among these people, these societies, our ancestors, there have been periods of hundreds of thousands of years with little technological change. Now our own species Homo sapiens has been traced to about 300,000 years ago. And even during, even in our own species, there have been periods of tens of thousands of years with little technological change. In more recent history, there have been periods of hundreds to thousands of years with little technological change in many areas of life. Now, why is this? First of all, 90% of subsistence economies involved production of energy, mainly through agriculture. There was little wealth to support innovators or even for very much education. 
Part of the reason for this is that land transport costs were high. Another reason was that peasants had little money to buy manufactured items. Uh, and there is a notable exception is that often there were salient innovations in the military sphere. Secondly, innovation increases complexity. People had found relatively simple technological solutions that worked. And thirdly, under conditions of low population and much land, there was little need to innovate. Ancient states actually had to encourage cultivation and population growth. High frequency innovation, as we can see in this chart, is a recent phenomenon. Uh, the chart shows um, patents issued in Great Britain, and you can see that it, um, it really starts to take off only about the mid 18th century, and that's with the Industrial Revolution and the increasing emergence of the coal-based economy. Um, and, and these were the conditions that made it possible for innovation to increase. So important points um, from this first set of slides is that high frequency innovation is not an innate characteristic of human societies. It's a characteristic only of our time. And secondly, such an unusual characteristic can exist only in specific historical circumstances. So what are the specific conditions of innovation? First of all, we need inexpensive energy permitting high societal complexity and discretionary consumption. Secondly, profit seeking by firms. And third, competition forcing continual innovation among firms. But is this system self-perpetuating forever? The continuity of our system requires, first of all, continued inexpensive energy. Energy being a small part of the economy allowing for discretionary spending and high complexity in our way of life. And this is a topic that I would like to go into, but because I'm constrained by time, I will not talk much about energy in this talk. I'll talk more about the second point is that our system requires constant or increasing returns to innovation. And this is a point that the technological optimists have failed to ask. Now, innovation has evolved from the area of what are called lone wolf geniuses in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, the picture here is Charles Darwin, such people as Gregor Mendel, um, uh, various other lone wolf scientists. This was how science was conducted in the past by lone wolf geniuses. Today, science is conducted by complex interdisciplinary teams. I did a Google search once on the term research team, and it returned over 61,000 images. And this search was done a number of years ago. So I teamed with some economists and some other scholars to investigate the productivity of innovation over time. And what we find is that the productivity of our system of innovation is declining. What we see here in the solid black line is that it takes more and more individual contributors to achieve a patent today. Uh, the chart begins in 1974 and goes up to the year 2012. And during this time, we see the size of research teams growing and growing and growing. Conversely, and this is our measure of productivity, the number of patents per inventor has been declining. Uh, it has been declining continually over a period of uh, in excess of 30 years. And there's every indication that this trend will continue because it relies on increasing complexity in the research process. Now, I will mention that our measure of productivity is the same as the measure of productivity in the economy as a whole its output per worker, okay? In this case, the output is innovations that merit a patent. And we can see that that output has been declining over time. Now we've broken this down to look at a variety of technical fields. I'm gonna skip a couple of the older fields. Uh, we can see here that the productivity of innovation in the energy sector has generally been declining. There is a 
short-term exception in solar energy uh, in the United States, I think solar energy, innovation in solar energy increased as a result of uh, changes in the tax law. But you can see that um, even here, the productivity rose for a while and is going down again. Um, here is uh, the productivity of information technology. This is the most dynamic part of, of our economies. It's the part that we have always assumed would see us into the future and would the, provide the basis for increased it, for continuing an increase in innovation. And what we see here is that in communications, computer hardware, and computer, soft, computer software, the productivity of innovation is actually decreasing, and it has beginning in 1974. Now, the newest technical, technical sectors in the United States Patent Office uh, are nanotechnology and biotechnology. One would think that if any fields show increasing productivity of innovation as new fields should, but here we see just the opposite. Even the newest fields are showing declining productivity of innovation. Now, this is also the case in the academic sector where it's been shown that uh, diverse interdisciplinary teams have come increasingly the manner by which um, academic uh, learning takes place, the, the manner by which new ideas are formulated and tested. Uh, uh, here, as in uh, the commercial patent system, we see that complexity increases through time. Now, a colleague of mine named Roderick Eggert gave testimony once uh, before Congress, the United States Congress. This was back in 2014. Uh, Dr. Eggert is a specialist in minerals. He points out that in the 1980s, cell phones used about 30 elements from the periodic table. At the time of his testimony in 2014, the contemporary smartphones used as much as 60 to 70 mineral derived elements. In the 1980s, a typical American household used about 30 elements from the periodic table. In 2014, General, the company General Electric used 70 of the first 83 mineral elements of the periodic table. This is obviously a trend that cannot continue. Uh, there are only so many elements on the periodic table. Now, I assume you've all heard of Moore's law. It is not really a law, it's an empirical observation. It's a, the observation is that the number of transistors on a chip doubles about every two years, while the cost of a computer is cut in half. Uh, that's great. That's why we can all afford uh, laptops and smartphones, except that it now takes 18 times as many researchers to continue Moore's law as it did in the 1970s. Uh, Moore's law suggests a constant exponential growth of about 35% per year, but this is based on research productivity that declines by 7% per year, year after year after year. Now, what are the implications um, of the research that we've done? Well, firstly, barring unforeseen developments, our system of innovation is heading in the direction of becoming either unproductive or unaffordable. Secondly, we have plucked much of the low-lying fruit in the area of knowledge production. Fundamental discoveries like electricity and penicillin no longer wait to be made. We can no longer discover these, these things, these simple things. As research problems grow increasingly intractable, the complexity of the research enterprise increases leading to diminishing returns to research investments as we've, shown, as we've seen in the various charts that I've shown you. Um, also, we have the impression of continued progress because the scale of the research enterprise has grown so large and it has been proposed to grow larger still. So we come back to what I consider the fundamental question of sustainability. It is, are the technological optimists correct? Can we always innovate to overcome resource depletion and other problems? 
or is our system of innovation vulnerable to its own decline, mirroring the decline of the factors that make it possible? Okay, and finally, can we sustain, sustain our way of life if our system of innovation declines? And I thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was very interesting. You have actually asked some questions. I don't know if we will have an answer to those questions because they're quite complex. And we will now give the floor to Antonio. So tell us. Well, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And actually that was, oh, I'm going to follow the line of what Joseph has been saying because I'm going to be sharing my screen first of all, and let's, let's start with it. Okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to use my stopwatch because I want to be fast about it. I'm sorry for the interpreter, but I'm going to go fast about it. I wanted to look at the different revolution data centers, the role of energy and 5G, obviously, because I... Why am, am I going to talk about this? Well, when we look at real data, such as the data that Joseph has um, showed, we talk about uh, denialism, and I talk to politicians and normal people. There are two sorts of denialism, the theoretical denialism, and they consider that the demand of competition does not, uh, well, clashes against uh, the efficiency that Joseph has talked about. So we have to, uh, we, they always think about new business opportunities, but there are some limitations of the physical world that are things that big data centers and technologies don't think about because we think, we always talk about gigatons in a computer and the grams can, we can jump from byte to kilobyte from watt to gigawatt. And we think that the same thing can be done in the physical world as, as though that was, that was normal. But let's look at the limitations of the physical world that has to consider weight and, and space and how that has impacted our lives. Well, really, this is not new. This thing about the fact that we were going to have a new revolution thanks to new technologies and information and knowledge. I don't know if you'll remember in 2008 as the as the markets crashed when we had the Lehman Brothers collapse quite quickly, Angela Merkel, as well as Nicolas Sarkozy were talking about the fact that they were going to refund capitalism. And that was going to be done thanks to a new green economy in a digital world uh, that was going to be inclusive and so on. And that's when we have the Smart 2020 report where they were designing the horizon for 2020. And this obviously um, appeared once again when the pandemic finished and the president of the Spanish government actually talked about a new economy, a new green economy, digital and inclusive economy. Since 2008 till 2020, many things have happened and we will see that almost none of the promises made, none of the things that were promised with Smart 2020 that was mainly championed by Telefónica in Spain, nothing was fulfilled. And why did all of this come about? Well, because I was actually looking at the social networks and I was looking at many different medias, communication media and so on, they were talking about 5G, which was an unavoidable thing, something that was going to happen and that was going to save the world. Well, actually, all of the technology um, without energy is just a sculpture. A computer, if it doesn't have an, an electrical source, it will not work. And that's when I started using all the data that um, um, Sunning and others uh, pr presented to us. But what they said was actually that there were going to be big capital expenses and energy expenses in order for that um, transition to be made. We were going to multiply the base stations to introduce 5G and the new technologies, new information and knowledge inf uh, technologies. And there uh, we were going to have to create cables, wirings and so on. So there was a metallic um, infrastructure that was needed. Alicia Valero talked about that the other day. We needed lots of devices that would require new materials as we saw. Um, now they have the whole periodic table in them, new combinations of semiconductors, uh, wireless uh, infrastructures with artificial intelligence that was going to make them more complex but also more efficient. And everyone was in agreement that this was going to bring uh, new opportunities, big opportunities. And if we look at the productivity, obviously, 
and in what terms it is expressed. If we look at them, at our story since 1950s till today, we see that there is a first industrial revolution. We see that there is a great rise. I'm sorry, 1850. And then it is maintained with a second industrial revolution with combustion engines. And then when um, information technologies, this goes down, as Joseph told us. So the ups and downs are actually more felt. They last they don't last as long and then we have all patents behind it. So when data centers were built, all of this has to be taken into account. So architects and designers and thinkers and so on talk about energy efficiency, the use of green energy, the use of renewable energies, the the fact that we needed to create um, data center buildings that are ecological, that are well designed so that they can keep all of this inside them very well. We had to choose the places for those buildings to be built that are adequate where there are no earthquakes, where they're protected from hurricanes and floods, a good uh, climatization management, which is very important because you have to, to cool them down. And most of the energy is dedicated to that, protection against the fires and so on, protection of the infrastructures that big technological companies say um, need to be protected and you need to use um, national networks that um, that care for sustainability and the environment. But in the end, what we have ended up uh, using is the surveillance capitalism, a constant creation of profiles, users, etc. Everything has to do with the distribution of publicity and programmed obsolescence. And we see that the forecast that they had in 2014, I'm sorry, no, in 2010, and then there was a revision in 2015, and then 2020, the Huawei technicians uh, said that in the worst case scenario, which is this scenario, from 2022 onward, this there would be an, in, an exponential increase of energy consumption. And in 2030, all information technologies and knowledge technologies would end up using 51% of uh, the world's electricity, so that represents 23% of CO2 emissions. That has been reviewed in a number of occasions, and the more law that Joseph was referring to takes us to actually this year, in, from 2020 till 2023, this would no longer work. So if we use this principle, then we see that Andrea's forecast would go up. But if we introduce these problems, then we would um, maintain that trend, that that um, growth, exponential growth of energy consumption. And if we include the fact that people were going to be starting using Internet of Things and uh, Moore's law would no longer work, then we would go beyond what was expected. So we could think that 40% of the energy consumption of smartphones, for instance, um, could actually be avoided if we had blockers, if we had blockers and we um, prohibited electronic advertising, which is one of the proposals that is really being defended right now. And what do designers and builders say? Well, the same thing, really. They say that at the moment would be rich to where over 20% in 2030 of the energy consumed would be dedicated to these sorts of, of consumption. And they say that obviously green is good for business and we have a problem, um, the problem that we current, we have with efficiency is that 35% of the energy consumed in data centers is used to cool them down. So many of them, although they're set in very cold areas, they have to be cooled. And we see that Google, for instance, Google, if you open Google, you would say that it says CO2 emissions in 2007. And this obviously means that Google is clearly saying that they know that they are buying CO2 quotas. I mean, these. this has been purchased, this has been paid for with money. And then let's talk about all of these things that I have seen uh, amongst the politicians when I appeared before the governments. For instance, a year ago, I, I was um, 
I was before the politicians and they thought that the increase of demand of computation would not have a problem with efficiency. But if we look at this paper that was published in December 2021, we see that ever since 1972, when the limits of growth were published until 2022, that is nowadays, we see that the consumption of energy, in this case oil, has uh, reached a plateau. And then when in the 70s we introduced oil and we... Um, and then uh, uh, um, deeper um, um, oil and fracking and so on, all of that is included with new technologies for the extraction of hydrocarbons. And what I like is really this yellow part on top, which is the energy that it takes to extract all of the things below. So in 73, with a barrel, we would get 100 barrels. So we had a lot of quantity for data centers, for museums, universities, hospitals. So that was the great acceleration. That's how it, call it was called. Now we are around 15 to 20 percent of the energy that we spend is for um, energy procurement but in 2040 it will be we will need a barrel to extract another barrel and this was known since 2014 that was known by the big companies of the sector and well from now onward what we are doing is changing um, about with the new next generation funds in Europe and the resilience and recovery funds, we are going to to pay for that um, business change. This which was this which is not profitable anymore. But this phenomenon, using more energy to get energy, is called the um, energy return rate, and you all know it. And this is our society. We here we see the CO two emissions, which is what makes um, economy grow. For now, it is still going up. It increased. Um, in 2016, with small drops in GDP when compared to the previous year, then in 2020 it went down due to the pandemic, the economy went down, and in 2021 we saw the economy going upward, but we see that the um, energy return rate is um, making our society to be very inefficient. We are now more or less here. We have gone through the best moment which was after the world, uh, Second World War where return rates were very high but now we are at around 1 to 5, 1 to 6 so what's important here is how to maintain a technological industrial society, a thermo industrial society with um, energy return rates as low as this so what would be the limit from which we would no longer be able to continue and if we look for instance at the renewable energies, in this case PV photovoltaic and the, the work that was presented to us by Capellan and others and Carlos de Castro and so on uh, from the University of Valladolid, um, our case systems, we see that the trend would be one to two in, in Spain with PV. So if we don't take into account many of, of the if we don't count what uh, gets to the user in the end, which is one to nine, but it's very, very low. And what does the mining sector say? Well, they were involved in this problem in 2015 and they reached the conclusion that if that with the data they had at the time for computers, for instance, and the average devices for 2015, we would have to to have an energy consumption that would be very, very high. And if we were to imagine that we could reach uh, 1,000 times higher efficiency than the one that we had in 2015, and so that we could get to the principle of Andauer, which is impossible, so it, that uh, moving an electron would uh, require no energy, then, then in 2050 we would have used all the energy that was consumed in 2010, and in 2070 we would be using all the energy that was consumed from 2010 to 2070, so the, the planet would be fried by then. So all of these things were not, um, all of these things were not being considered in the new economic models. We had a reduction of diesel, and now the problem that we have, which is uh, the diesel, which is the blood of the system, has gone down from 2018 till 2021. Now it's recovered a bit but still we have that problem so that is a consumption of Spain for instance um, primary energy consumption in Spain here we see that in electricity we have gas in 2008 as in every country that fell and there is less energy consumption but it was important to look at the picture what was happening during the maximum energy consumption in 27 2008 when Spain was consuming almost 100 Uh, they were consuming equivalents in oil. And here you have the gigawatts. 
it was almost 120,000 gigawatts per hour. This picture that we have from 2008 had a vision, which was this vision, where we see what the big cities look like, Madrid, Barcelona, Bilbao. They are the ones receiving most of the energy. This is the, the change between generation and demand. And this is also interesting for the consumption of other resources. And if we and, and we can also see the other part, the other side of the um, of the coin, which is waste generated. And this is due to the fact that Spain went from nineteen uh, hundreds, um, three people living three people living in cities and seven living in the rural areas, and now we are mostly urban dwellers. We have most of us in cities and then two in rural areas and so eight um, cities two in rural areas so the sector of technologies and energy is completely corrupted in spain we have the problem of revolving doors people coming out of politics to get into big um big commodities companies and another denialism that i have seen is that we could grow we could have a gdp growth worldwide from 2020 by reducing energy consumption and reducing CO2 emissions. This is what Arias Cañete presented in Europe when he was a commissioner uh, for the European Union. He actually was uh, the one who coined that because we also had a uh, commissioner saying that the GDP would be n unlinked from the use of resources. We could dematerialize the economy, but not that NATO actually reached the conclusion that that was not possible. And the European Agency for the Environment reached the conclusion that that was not possible. And they published articles and meta studies using these five um, articles, seeing whether it would be possible to dematerialize the economy thanks to IT's. Um, information technologies and digital resources, and they reached the conclusion that it was not going to be easy. So how had we managed to do that? Because some economists did say that if GDP is to grow, and here we see uh, an increase in energy, here we have 2008, when there was a collapse of markets in 2008, we see that the US and Europe increased their GDP by reducing energy consumption. So clearly the miracle was possible, but here there was a trick. Uh, the trick here was China or India. They were the ones doing the dirty work. The emissions took place far away from our borders and we were growing because we could grow. So in the end, this led us to finishing um, with the middle class. We we killed the middle class and we saw a multiplication of, of the wealthiest people, the multi-millionaires. So we went in the opposite direction of what we had wanted to establish in 2015 with our 2030 agenda, which was end inequalities. And the other denialism is the denialism of minerals extractions. If it's uh, more and more expensive to extract these minerals due to geological reasons, the um, International Energy um, Agency was telling us that the price of energy would go up. Three examples, copper, for instance, it has uh, increased the demand. Here we have the la red line, lithium, we're going to require all of this if we want to have the transition that has been proposed from Germany and then from the rest of countries. And here, for instance, cobalt. So this is what, what we know we have, and this is what we intend to do. Our Smart 2020, remember that Smart 2020 was already saying that in the end, um, the transportation sector was very bad, so we needed to substitute things. This is paradoxical. Instead of, of coming to Madrid and then go back, we were going to do these conferences, online conferences and so on. So at the time the 2020 was presented in universities, we were actually... Um, we were actually hopeful. Telefonica presented these things in all provinces and all capital cities, and we reached the conclusion that data servers um, and data centers had been multiplied in 2020, and now they consume almost 10%. We have seen it a few moments ago of energy consumption. And for all of these things that we intend to do, this digitization, we will require around 360 um, uh, 360,000 tons of uh, lithium and then cobalt and nickel and so on. So in the end, if we have these trends, then 
the geological services in Finland, which are very good in this, they say that electrifying all the economy will require lots of copper. But right now we're seeing what is the consumption, what is the important um, energy consumption. And we are eating up mountains because that is what we can extract and reduce the copper, what we could get a few mo uh, years ago it, by... by um, Using using rocks in mountains, we would get a lot of copper. But now we have to go through much more rock. And when it's over 0.05%, we consume less energy. But from here onward, we have a problem and energy consumption goes up just to get that copper for our digital transition. So obviously, the price of things goes up just as lithium which has multiplied by 10 in 2021. So there are some physical limitations, limitations in the physical world. Only engineers are aware of this, are aware of this problem that we have. And really the physical world, as we have seen, um, shows that minerals are the ones supporting this digital transition. Behind this problem, we have the high energy costs that we would have to invest in in order to reach this point. And I will finish with one example, just one example, the example of Germany. Angela Merkel was a woman who did what she called Die Wende, the uh, transition, uh, the energy transition, where uh, citizens participated and the whole world participated so that they could have a renewable energy system that was interesting and sustainable. So they had up to 16% of their energy in renewables, out of which 3.5% was wind. And how did they do that? Well, by having all of these wind farms in their country. And that's how they, they got 3.5% for 2020. And how does this take place? Well, because if we use a, a wind as a unit, we see that the space that it occupies has to be multiplied by one, um, 1,100 in order to have gas or by 1,000 with regards to coal and with PV, it would. we already know what the situation is. So that's the case and that is it. And I was going to talk about Jacobson that was presented in my city in Pamplona, uh, saying that it was going to be very easy to have this transition, but uh, then the U.S. Academy um, went against him. I'm sure that um, our colleague Tainted knows about this. They, they actually had to pay the costs in certain trials. And they asked me to do a report for a foundation in Navarra to talk about the uh, mining sector in this transition. And, and, and that was something that politicians were... were um, um, championing, but now they have not been able to continue. But I was going to talk about the evolution about our planet in certain points, but I will not have the time. I will leave it for some other day because I'm taking too much of your time. So I just wanted to thank you for your attention, but I see that I've already talked for 21 minutes, so I went over the time that was given to me. Well, thank you. Thank you, Antonio, so much for being so um, respectful of time. And I was actually going to give you a few minutes, but you didn't realize that. I'm sure that during the questions that I hope people will be asking, I actually encourage the audience to ask questions on the chat. I'm sure you will be able to give us more information. And for the third intervention, we will have an expert, as I was telling you previously, Maria Alegre. She is an expert in crypto cryptocurrency, which is one of the sectors of the digital world that really consumes big amounts of energy. As a matter of fact, the European Commission yesterday, considering this energy crisis that we are facing this um, this winter, this coming winter, they said that we need to limit the consumption of this sector. And... Let's see if Maria can tell us a bit more about this and how it works and what it consists of and what are the challenges and the risks that we face. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rosa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the organizers for their invitation. I am Maria Alegre, and my intervention today is about electrical consumption of cryptocurrency mining or crypto, crypto mining. But what is a cryptocurrency, just to begin with? A cryptocurrency is a digital currency, a virtual currency that is protected by cryptography so that it is almost impossible to falsify it or spend it twice. Uh, a final characteristic of cryptocurrencies is that they're not issued by any central authority. 
So that prevents from a bad management or manipulation by the government through a central bank, a central bank that would coin them or that could have monetary policies with them. An example of cryptocurrency, I'm sure you've heard talk about Bitcoin, obviously, but there are many others. Ethereum is the second one with regards to importance. And then there is Touchcoin, Cardano, Litecoin, Binance, etc., etc., etc. There are many different cryptocurrencies that appear. Cryptocurrency is generated through crypto mining, an activity that has two purposes. On the one hand, it generates new cryptocurrency, as I said, but it also verifies the legitimacy of transactions that uh, take place with this cryptocurrency so that they can then be added to a centralized accounting book, which is called a blockchain, a term that I'm sure you already know. So this is a process, a dual process that generates more cryptocurrency and that allows for the ones in circulation to be used in a safe way because if anyone validates the transactions, then the decentralized nature of blockchain, this accounting book, could allow uh, falsifiers to use one currency over and over. But this crypto mining is used to verify transactions and that avoids fraud and reinforce the trust of users in cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency requires something called a consensus mechanism to guarantee that all the interested parties um, who want to be crypto miners are in agreement with regards to legitimate transactions and they avoid the possibility of a person spending the same currency twice and committing fraud. And in order for those verifications to take place, Bitcoin as any other cryptocurrency would use a mechanism, a consensus mechanism between the parties, which is called proof of work. And once the block of transactions is completed, crypto miners will compete against each other to be the first one to solve mathematical problems that are extremely complex. And when one um, solves the equation, they will validate the transaction. And that will allow miners to generate cryptocurrency on their own as a reward for their work. And this competition between crypto miners requires very special and sophisticated equipment with great computational power, with great power and with specialized software. So you cannot do it with any uh, home device or laptop. And as a consequence, this activity consumes lots of electricity and wastes lots of electricity and it adds up as new miners will be part of the network. So this proof of work, this process, doesn't only waste electricity, it also generates electronic waste because the servers, these specialized servers that are used for crypto mining, often are obsolete after one and a half years and will end up in landfills. We already know that our societies are not characterized by being especially effective or efficient with regards to recycling and reusing. But in order to have a context of what uh, electrical consumption is for crypto, crypto mining, Cambridge University, through the Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Index, has developed an index that is specific for Bitcoin. And it became a very important tool to visualize the impact of this industry in a greenhouse gas effect gas emission. So this index considers the global consumption per year will be 100 terawatt per hour in 2022. If Bitcoin were a country, it would be um, number 34 in the electrical consumption ranking below Pakistan and the Netherlands and above Kazakhstan, Belgium, Philippines um, and Chile. So Bitcoin mining represents 0.145% of the world consumption of electricity. Other examples, so that we set the frame, the context of Bitcoin's electrical consumption globally, data centers consume 200 terawatts per hour. World um, steel and iron production um, represents 1,200 terawatts per hour. And cement, 384. Uh, paper, 586 terawatts per hour. And these are the industries that use more electricity in the world. All the television sets in the U.S. consume per year 60 terawatts per hour. And the electrical consumption of Bitcoin per year is like the demand of electricity of the Cambridge University for 728 years and could feed all the kettles used to boil water for tea in the UK for 22 years. So 
these are statistics that the Cam that Cambridge University publishes that are quite explanatory so that we see what the electrical consumption for crypto mining is just for Bitcoin. Okay. What are other specificities of crypto mining? Because it usually concentrates in places where the electricity uh, tariffs are lower and where temperatures are lower so that uh, the equipments can be cooled without needing um, air conditioning or ventilation. The thing is that most of the countries that have these characteristics that have low electricity tariffs and low temperatures usually generate electricity by using fossil fuels. In 2019, China concentrated 50% of um, crypto mining activities. And in China as well, over 50% of the electricity that is being produced is produced in coal centrals, which is the fuel that is most polluting and the one that produces most CO2 and that contributes most to greenhouse gas um, gases that cause climate change. So crypto mining has a great footprint and we consider that the activity this year will generate around 50 million tons um, CO2, which represents 0.1% of world emissions. If Bitcoin, I'm sorry, no, yes, actually, if Bitcoin were a country, it would be number 88 in, C in greenhouse gas emission ranking out of 129 countries. So it would be in the top 50% uh, of the emitting countries. And crypto mining, not only is there greenhouse gas emissions, but it also has a disproportionate impact on the distribution networks. So that obviously... Um, has an impact in the stability of the network and it causes blackouts and with all the consequences that that entails. And I'm going to give you two examples of negative impact of crypto mining. Some of you, I'm sure, already know that the U.S. is actively working to decarbonize electrical production before 2030. They have the second greatest capacity for electricity production with coal after China. But... They are making much progress with the energy and electrical transition with the decarbonization of the sector. But in an agreement that was signed at the end of 2020, Marathon, a mining, a Bitcoin mining company, became the only um, client of the coal central in the state of Montana that was about to close because they didn't have any clients. They weren't producing for anyone. The company established a data center in eight hectares that are close to the coal center with over 30,000 uh, units of a computer that specializes in Bitcoin. The emissions of that um, those facilities in the fourth quarter um, increased 5,000 uh, 5, because they were simply dedicated to providing electricity to this to these crypto mining facilities. Another example with regards to the impact in infrastructures. China in 2019 concentrated 50% of crypto mining activities, but since it is a, such a decentralized and an autarchic an, an activity, the Chinese government decided to forbid it completely in May last year, 2021. So what happened? Well, many of those centers of that activity went to Kazakhstan, which caused... Well, this is actually a, a neighboring country. So 20% of the crypto mining activities are now in Kazakhstan. In November last year, um, the Financial Times it published that 80,000 machines had migrated in a few weeks from China to Kazakhstan. And thus, the electrical demand at the end of the year in Kazakhstan had increased 8% when during that time of year, usually there is no increase, it uh, increases one to two percent. And that destabilized the electrical grid and caused blackouts in six different regions since October 2021. The three main electrical centrals in the north of the country had to close as an emergency reaction. So imagine what that impact had for industries, hospitals, schools and homes in that region. And the government notified that they were cutting the supply to all the miners registered in the country. And here we have another problem. Most of the crypto mining activities are outside of, of the registries. They're not registered. So just a few of them are registered and are included in the government regulations. But the good thing about this is that the industry is trying to improve itself. 
and with the same agility that they have become disruptive, they're also reacting to their environmental impact. And I'm going to talk about Ethereum, which is the second biggest cryptocurrency after Bitcoin, which in September, just a month ago, completed a plan to reduce their carbon emissions in over 99%. What they did was change the way in which they manage transactions in their blockchain, in this accounting book, in this ledger, which is public and centralized, and we talked about it at the beginning. And this is the one that supports cryptocurrency and that creates more cryptocurrency. So this change means that Ethereum is no longer being produced with proof of work, which is the process that I described at the beginning of my intervention, where computers compete against each other to validate the transactions and generate new cryptocurrency. So now what they do is a new system, which is a proof of participation, where the people and the companies act as validators, betting somehow, their own cryptocurrency as a way of guarantee to get more cryptocurrency. And this protocol, this participation protocol, designates in a random way and following pre-established criteria these validators of transactions. So there is no longer this, this uh, fierce competition between mining uh, miners that requires such power. So mining power and that gets so much electricity consumed. So their electrical footprint should go from 8.5 gigawatts to less than 85 megawatts from one day to the next. So 99% reduction. And we understand that this change could represent 0.2% of the world consumption of the world to disappear from one day to the next. But this is just for Ethereum right now. So Bitcoin is still the main individual contributor to the CO2 footprint in the world of cryptocurrency. This change that many consider is the most important event in the world in the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency was received positively in the markets because Ethereum has uh, made this public and its stock went up 2%. And it is considered that it's $200 um, billion dollars if we consider the value of this, of this cryptocurrency. And there is also an initiative called Crypto Climate Accord, where 200 signatories who are participants in the crypto market commit to achieving zero net emissions of electricity consumption linked to all their operations for 2030 and to inform on the progress towards this objective of having net emissions using the best practices in the industry. And they, they consider that since the roots of cryptocurrency is open code, agility and technological innovation, this industry is ideal to manage something that the world hasn't yet not seen, which is decarbonating, the quick decarbonization of a whole industry. So the idea, as I told you, is to have zero emissions, net emissions, for the signatories of this agreement for 2030 and to develop standards and tools and technologies to accelerate the adoption and to verify the progress towards a 100% renewable blockchain for the next um, meeting, the next COP meeting uh, for 2030. So there are 200 individuals and companies that have already signed it. It's a very small number, but there is at least a concrete initiative to decarbonize the industry by advising and innovating and escalating these, um, these actions and these initiatives. The, Crypto mining is, um, has its roots in open source, and as I said, that requires agility and technological innovation. And that is basic to, to build on this progress that is taking place in the de decarbonization of electrical systems. Renewable energies are not competitive in costs in the electrical markets uh, the, the world over, so they are now very present in the grid, and now the grids are more clean and there is a possibility for synergies. And to finish my presentation, the idea of decarbonizing the electrical uh, system worldwide is a great challenge uh, with regards to home consumption and so on. So cryptocurrency 
has an associate consumption that has been quite disruptive in a very short amount of time. And what's interesting and unheard of is that part of the industry has been able to identify, recognize, and uh, react quickly with regards to this negative impact that their electrical consumption had in emissions and infrastructure, and to correct with agility um, this part of its uh, way of functioning so that they could reduce their emissions. And this is actually very good news and unheard of if we consider the resistance and the time it has taken to traditional energies to, uh, to stop using fossil fuels and to recognize their responsibility and to decide to act with regards to climate action. But it's all in development. Everything has to be done to be monitored. Everything has to be followed up. So we'll see what happens. And those were my final words. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. To be honest, at least we end our presentations with a positive example of a sector where it seems that if we want, things can work. And to, to be honest, I, I think it's not only been interesting, I think it has been quite explanatory with regards to the situation currently. And I also wanted to ask all three speakers one question, because up till now, we have been told, um, the whole society has been told, to all of us who are not specialists in the sector, that the technological world was going to help us overcome climate crisis. And that's where the solution needed to come from, technology and renew renewable uh, energies. And Professor Tainter was telling us a few minutes ago during his intervention that productivity is going down, although production is going up. And it seems that the production goes up, but productivity goes down. And Antonio was telling us that energy is going to be less efficient in considering the, the trend. And I wanted to ask you, what should be the, the road to follow to avoid um, potential collapse or a potential deep crisis? Because we're already in a crisis, but this crisis is becoming even more acute. So uh, could you maybe tell us what could be the exit from this solution? Uh, Professor Tainter, uh, Professor Joseph Tainter, could you maybe give us? There is no simple answer to this. Now, I, I don't want my talk to be misinterpreted. Innovation is not just going to go away. Um, but this is already affecting several technical sectors like the pharmaceutical industry, um, the, the defense industry, uh, with its reliance now on very high technology, very complex technologies. Uh, they have, they now have these remarkable shells that can, artillery shells that can pick out an individual target, but they cost something like $40,000 a piece. Um, in, in terms of the future of innovation, I, I don't suggest anything is going to happen immediately. Uh, innovation consists primarily of taking things that already exist and putting them together in new ways, as we've been doing with information technology. But in the future, um, and, and, and a lot of, so many individual things have been invented that we can continue on that course for, I, I think, a fairly long time. But what's going to happen is that individual technical sectors are going to begin to have problems uh, in, in re getting, getting satisfactory returns on their investments in innovation. And funding bodies, such as, let's say, the United States Congress, are going to start continuing um, support for individual law in, in certain technical sectors and certain lines of research and and, to, and, and this this has been happening already it's a normal thing that legislative bodies do uh, I, I do think that by the end of this century keep in mind i'm a historian and archaeologist so i think long term by the end of this century i think our system of innovation will be very different mm -hmm. Antonio? Antonio? Well, um, many different interesting things have been said here. Um, there is no um, economic activity, no activity whatsoever, that by being more efficient has managed to reduce the consumption of something. And, and that makes us think, doesn't it? Because 
Somebody asked here on the chat and, and we were saying, well, are, we're going to keep on growing and growing and growing, as you were saying, Rosa. It's not that uh, we are less efficient, it's just that our society and the energy sources, especially the non-renewable ones, which are mainly, well, 90% or 80-something percent of all energy sources, are, are more difficult to, to extract. And actually, I was just giving the example of, of irrigation in Spain. The irrigation in Spain, when we tried to modernize it at the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s, we said, well, we actually, I actually have data from the ministry saying the consumption of water will be reduced at 30%. Well, what happened was that irrigation was modernized. You changed the uh, irrigation system, and now people said, okay, then um, I consume less, and that way I what I can do is increase the number of hectares that I'm going to be irrigating, not just the legal ones, but also the illegal ones. So we went from, we went to a, a very serious drought um, period and 75 to 80% of the water that is consumed in Spain is for irrigation. We have had very good examples this year with the supposed drought. So in a context, in a situation, where there is a constant growth, when we're constantly looking for growth, infinite growth, well, what efficiency does in the case of 5G, for instance, or technologies, information technologies and digitization, is that you become more efficient, so you consume more energy. So if we used to have cell phones that were very, very expensive, well, now we have four devices, and that then the, the consumption increases. And that is what's happening if the objective is always infinite growth. So we should start thinking, do we really need that growth, that infinite growth? And Maria, I don't know if you want to add something to this. No, I think actually that Antonio as well as Joseph have actually answered that question very well. So if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that an option, a possible option, or the one that we should be considering, is that of non-growth. I don't know if what you think about that possibility of non-growth or degrowth that uh, is very much on vogue right now. How could it be possible in this digital world where uh, it seems that we are constantly growing, that dark cloud that won't stop growing? Can we start thinking about that? Now that it seems that this is an expansion, could we think about stopping things, stopping growth? And I'm not even mentioning degrowing. What are the possibilities of that, of that happening? I don't know. I don't know who wants to take the floor. Joseph and Maria. I think, actually, it's very, it's very difficult to to stop this fast-paced advance of the virtual world, because everything. I mean, all the industries are completely invested in in virtual solutions to be able to work, to grow, to automatize, to improve efficiency. But we need to do it in, in a sustainable way and, and as efficient as possible, as efficiently as possible. We need to be aware of the resources consumption that is taking place and how, how we're going to grow, what the electrical and energy consumption will be in industry so that they can sustain that growth. It's going to be very difficult to stop the growth of the cloud because it's a very fast, uh, it's a very fast paced growth, but we have to do it in sync with the changes that we're seeing in the way in which energy is being produced and also considering all the different implications and how we're generating energy and electricity. As, as Antonio was saying a moment ago, all of this renewable um, energies a revolution is going to cause new geopolitical pressures on uh, on mining resources. So there isn't a bullet, um, a, a silver bullet to solve this. We have to do it with responsibility and being aware of what the situation is so that we don't uh, repeat the problems that we have caused with energy consumption up till now. I, I think that just like there has been a transfer of resources, energy resources in this case, from transportation to to what we're doing now, for instance, there will be other cases. We also see, on the other hand, that many of the papers that have been published 
Many authors actually say that if we block um, ads, digital ads, then we could save up to 40% of the energy. And that's quite interesting. And going back to what Maria was saying, I really think that we are in a, we're very well positioned. I would not say it's, it's amazing, but we have a great position to have a lab and we can see what happened with Smart 2020. Smart 2020 proposed in that refunding of capitalism thanks to digital technologies. They saw a diminution of 20% in CO2 emissions, 15, 20% in CO2 emissions, saying that Precisely, technologies, information technologies in 2020 would represent 3% of the um, CO2 emissions and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And that's the only thing that they, they knew because actually they have increased 15%. But we were going to have a GDP growth of I don't know how much and they were going to introduce in strategic sectors such as transportation so that the automatization and the management of the goods transportation would cause for the sector that that is usually the devil in every report is transportation would be managed in a different way and a wonderful way and in all the processes, all the industrial processes, the automatization and digitization was going to cause great savings in energy consumption. But 2020 has come about and nothing, nothing happened. So we don't have a very good um, example. So I'm sorry for being such a pessimistic person, but I'm being realistic. We are now um, in the second turn of this capital, capitalism refunding again with technologies, but now we have an energy problem. We have an energy problem. So talking about infinite growth is going to be impossible. Uh, it's just, I just uh, have to be clear, it's impossible. Are there solutions? Obviously, there are lots of solutions, but we cannot think that we will be able to grow in an infinite way. And especially because we're talking about places such as the British islands, where they're talking about blackouts. Uh, we are talking about other countries where they will have um, standard cuts to be able to better manage their, their energy. Joseph, I would like to know what you think about this as an expert in civilization collapses, um, complex civilizations collapses, because you have studied what happened in the past. Looking, looking towards the future, do you think that there will be a collapse due to this explosion of uh, consumption and use of energy and digitization and use of mineral resources and so on? I, I often find myself wondering if we are heading for what's called a steady state economy. A, a no growth economy. That's not the same as a degrowth economy. It's a, it's a steady state economy. Now understand that I'm not advocating this, but I think it is a real possibility. Uh, I'm not advocating it because there's some serious problems with the no growth economy. Uh, but when I pose to my students uh, the question about are we heading for a no growth economy, ask them to consider what the implications are, they are completely baffled by it. They, they simply don't know how to answer. They can't conceive of it. Yes, I guess that, especially for generations who were born um, in this time, it's very complicated because it's true that the, the cloud and the digital side of things and this development is is, has not come about at the same time everywhere in the world uh, because there are societies in the planet who are very much at the margins of all of this that we are mentioning of these problems. They do feel the impact, but indirectly due to the use of resources, but uh, they, don't, they are not part of this. They're not directly impacted. Yes, Antonio. Yes, that's your students. Well, imagine politicians, the politicians when we talk to them. Okay, so I think there are many interventions on the chat. I see that there is actually a debate going on on the chat with regards to the topics that we're mentioning here. And one of the participants, Javier Rico, was saying that if this meeting, instead of being digital, instead of being in the cloud, 
had been face to face, how how much emission would have been, how many emissions would have been generated, what the impact would have been. And now, since it's digital, it doesn't have that much of an impact. So I'm actually reading that question because uh, telework and, 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 and tele, tele teaching, I mean, remote teaching are being considered as alternatives to uh, pollute less and consume less energy. And I would like to know what you think about this. Was, how should we take on this? What should be our approach? For example, Antonio. For instance, Antonio. Well, it, it depends. I mean, we would have to see each case separately. If Joseph has to travel from the US, obviously his trip would have covered, um, should cover 100 events such as this one. But with time, it is probable that there would be a transfer of, of energy resources from, for instance, a kerosene that is burned by planes to the maintenance of the grid. I think that that is going to happen. But yes, it's true that we are going to digitize the economy more. We um, are going to digitize it more, but we mustn't expect miracles. And someone wrote something very interesting on the chat. I mean, this is, um, we can share here, um, a thousand, um, a thousand or two thousand sword. It's one or one, one 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 or one sword, etc. Um, it, but we have to eat. I mean, it's in the end we have to eat, and it's what I was saying during my presentation. I didn't explain it very well about the the mindset that we still have in many sectors, many economic sectors, thinking that. Uh, now you click with a mouse and that's it. And you say, well, here, instead of a gram, we will have a ton. And here uh, we do structures, we do construction structures. We we uh, transfer big electricity centrals by clicking a mouse. But when we get to the real world, uh, the, the real world, things wait. There are climate change, there are atmosphere attacks, there are chemical attacks, and we have to eat our beans and, and vegetables and fruits, and that, and that cannot be done with a click of a mouse. So we need to have a strategic support um, to organize things and to automatize things such as the transportation of, of goods that are necessary. And for me, that is the main question. How much does this consume uh, compared to this other thing? If I live in Mostoles and you're doing this in, in Madrid, then maybe I should go, I should be there physically. But if I live in the US and I have to travel all the way from the US, then I wouldn't do it because it would represent 20 meetings, meetings such as this one with regards to emissions. I don't know if you want to add something. Uh, in the case of cryptocurrency, Maria, well, cryptocurrencies and, and their position, up till now, this is not the monetary system that is being used the world over. Do you think that in the end it will replace the other system that we have, the other economic transactions, transaction system that we have worldwide? Do you think it'd be better if companies decide, like Ethereum, I think it was, to, to follow a more sustainable road, would it be more sustainable than the current system that also obviously uses lots of energy and electricity? Well, according to what I have read, it's very difficult for Bitcoin due to, due to its design of this specific cryptocurrency, it's very difficult for Bitcoin to be able to transition towards a system that Ethereum proposes to reduce electricity consumption, but they will have to do something, obviously, because the scrutiny um, on this industry is great and on all industries is actually growing. And consumers and governments are much more vigilant um, with regards to the impact that they have, not just these industries, but all industries, as I was saying previously. So I don't know, I, I don't think that cryptocurrency will replace traditional currencies, the ones coined by governments. But clearly many countries in the world, uh, we don't use cash and everything is transactions, digital transactions and digital payments. And obviously that has many 
advantages with regards to democratization of financial access in many sectors where they wouldn't have that access. But cryptocurrencies replacing the solidity and the transparency and the stability that a monetary, a centralized monetary system controlled by a governmental institution, well, I think that'd be very difficult. Bitcoin was worth twice as much last year, so it changes. It's just a financial tool for speculation. I don't know if it could be considered as solid or robust as a, a currency coined and issued by a central authority. I was going to look at whether we had any other questions on the chat that I could ask you. But if not, I would like you to tell me because um, a new summit, a new climate summit is going to begin in a few days in Egypt. I don't know these these things. I've been to some uh, summits and the digital and electronic topics are not protagonists in this sort of, of um, meetings, at least up till now. And I would like you to tell me after 26 uh, climate summits that we have had in our history, what do you think about these sorts of, of gatherings, world gatherings that take place on a yearly basis? And what are your expectations with regards to, to this COP? What do you think we could expect out of it? Are you pessimistic with regards to the next one that will take place in Egypt? Joseph, for instance, because he's he's very quiet. He's been quiet for for some time now. I really don't have anything to say about it. I'm I'm afraid I don't pay attention to these international conferences. Mm -hmm. Well, if we think about what could happen and and whether concrete actions are going to be taken for once and for all, I think that. Uh, pessimism is is the general trend. The report of uh, the UN with regards to national contributions has been quite firm when saying that there isn't currently a um, clear path and believable path towards the reduction of emissions that would be needed to um, avoid the increase of 1.5 degrees in temperature. What we have seen in the COPs is that the, um, the measures taken are never enough. If we think about the first conversation that we had in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro 30 years ago, when we talked about climate for, for the first time, and the perspectives are unfortunately not very promising. Antonio, I don't know if you would like to add something. Well, with regards to the question that you asked about the COPs, I don't really believe the COPs. I wanted the one in Madrid, and I thought it was a fair. It was a fair painted green, and I thought that big energy companies were all there with with dinosaurs of different political parties being there talking about uh, sustainability, and I thought it was just the tale they were telling us. But we have talked about very interesting things here. So let's go to the core of things, because someone talked about uh, programmed obsolescence. That is one of the pillars for our transition. That is one of the main pillars, because it, when we talk about r and &I, which is research, development, and innovation, that is something that we all love, and we all pay happily our taxes because we want for companies to deal with r and &I. The problem is that what most of them have done up till now, most of them, I don't say all of them, is to use those funds, those r and &I, which are the fruit of our work, to create objects that will fail us two years down the road. So we're investing um, the work of people in creating machines, your washing machine or your microwave, to die two years later. So one of the proposals that were made here on the chat, I think it was Teresa who was saying this, was that they should be responsible. And the EU has been working on that for uh, I don't know how long. We don't know how long they've, uh, they've been working on that, on that topic and trying to do something about it and fight so that companies are responsible for the replacement and maintenance of your machines. And somebody said that a device, a, a 10 year ago device might not allow you to do this or that. Well, but that's not true. I currently have an iMac 
that I purchased in 2011, and Apple is the queen of obsolescence, um, of programmed obsolescence, and what I do is use um, free software with Linux, and there are some developers in the world who, through Open Core, a platform, allow you to use a new um, operating systems. So what did I have to do? I had to use my screwdriver, open my Mac, and instead of having a, um, a um, VHD disk, I have to use a solid one, and I increase my RAM memory. And now we have a small, um, I've also done it with a small one, and I can do it. And, and it can be done. I mean, obviously, I love doing these things. I love doing it, and I do it with my family and friends. And I install lots of different uh, free software systems. But uh, some people say, I've uh, got a Pentium with Linux, I can do almost everything. Obviously, it can perfectly well, but then there is publicity, as we were saying, and programmed obsolescence. So that is one of the pillars, one of the cornerstones of this, of this problem. It's mm, basic. Okay, and to finish, I have one last question for Joseph Tainter. Written on the chat, it says, a society with renewable energies, isn't it more complex? Is it closer to collapse? Yes, the, the answer is yes. Um, shifting to renewable energies, it will produce um, systems of greater complexity. I don't know that they necessarily lead to collapse. Uh, what concerns me the most about our immediate future, um, aside from climate change, is the, 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 con the conjunction of globalization with just-in-time delivery. And if those systems fail, um, there, is, there are no commercial products being circulated. There's no food in the, in the stores. And with the, uh, with the consequences of, um, of the coronavirus and the disruptions in supply chains from that, uh, we, we see a, a warning shot of what exactly can happen when supply chains are disrupted. Uh, it's not just globalization and supply chains, it's that combined with what's called just-in-time delivery so that um, companies no longer stockpile things. With the exception of Amazon, they stockpile everything. Um, but for the most part, um, this, this is what concerns me most for the immediate future. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much. I think that we unfortunately have run out of time. We could obviously spend hours and hours learning from all three of you, Maria, Antonio and Joseph. And thank you. I would like to thank La Casa Encendida. I would like to thank the uh, Green Europeans Foundation and the Foundation Transición Verde for having organized this seminar. And I wanted to remind you that on November 3rd, we will have the third session called The Luminous Side of the Cloud. Maybe that will be more enlightening. It will provide us with solutions because that's the digitization that we want. That is at least what we desire for, so that this cloud is a bit less dark than what it currently seems. And we will have Coral Calero, Julieta Arancio, um, who's from the uh, University of Dressel in the US, and the Green European Kim van Spantak, moderated by Raul Gomez, who's the director of the Foundation Transición Verde. Thank you all so much for having been here during this day. We have lots of interesting messages here. On the one hand, that message saying that we have to, to try and reuse as much as we can because energy is going to be scarce and it will be very difficult to obtain. And we also need to have a greater efficiency if possible without that efficiency, meaning that we have to use more energy uh, so that we don't waste more energy. We need to have efficiency that goes in the opposite sense. And the productivity of our innovation system is going to be decreasing, apparently. But we try to find that balance that will allow us to have a fairer society and a more hopeful future. So thank you all very much. Thank you, all three. For being here, and we will see you on November 3rd with Transición Verde at La Casa Encendida. Thank you very much, everyone.